Hello and welcome back to Sounds on the Couch. I am really looking forward to introducing today's guest for you. We've got Dr. Paul Paddle, who is an ENT, a head and neck surgeon with a fellowship training in larynxology, um, which is all about voice, airway and swallowing disorders. Uh, He has a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery with honours at Melbourne University, receiving the Ducks of Surgery. Uh, He's also got a fellowship to the Royal and Australasian College of Surgeons with advanced training in otolaryngology, and I know I've said that incorrectly, so he can correct me afterwards, um, which is head and neck surgery. So Paul has been involved with developing a vocal fitness training app, which is currently in the alpha testing stage, which we will hear more about throughout our chat. So let's just bring him up and we can start hearing all that he has to share with us. Hello, Paul. Hi, good evening, Karen. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. (laughs) So let's maybe start by just sharing a little bit about your background and what it was that inspired you to start working in such a specialised field. Um, Thanks, Karen. Um, So... Medical school, you you met with all kinds of opportunities and choices, um, and it's as much as you like to think it's all part of some grand plan you've schemed together. Sometimes it's just about serendipity, like it is with most opportunities. So I was in surgical training, and I met someone who is an ENT and uh, very inspiring, um, and seemed to have a happy, fulfilling life. And then as you get to see the range and breadth and depth of what we do in ENT, um, that was inspiring from little newborn babies to end of life issues, from tiny little operations on ears and voice boxes um, to big operations involving incisions in the neck. Um, So it very much appealed. But then more specifically for me, for voice, airway and swallow, um, I have a music background. And so the the ability to marry the two, um, the surgical especially and the the, the art, I suppose, of the voice um, was immediately appealing. And right place, right time, introduced to someone else who was inspiring in that field and, you know, cliche, but the rest is history. Fantastic. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about your musical background as well. So where, what does your musical background look like? Um, look, at the moment, it's mostly, um, my kids would say, torturing them uh, with what? their cello and violin and piano lessons. Um, but um, myself, classically trained in piano and viola, so, you know, did uh, classical training up to Amos, and, um, but also did a lot of singing in a cappella choirs for, through school and competitions. And, and also my mother is from Slovenia, it's a tiny, little ta- uh, tiny little country um, next to Italy. And they have a strong folk song tradition as most um, uh, smaller countries, as most countries do. And so we did a lot of singing, my sister and I, over the years. So it's, um, as most of your listeners know, um, music uh, from an early age, it's just something that grabs you in your soul and it always keeps grabbing you. So now I get to share it with my kids in the car uh, and with my um, patients and clients, I suppose. Um, so it's, it's good to be able to bring the two together. Yeah, and it must be amazing to be able to bring that passion into something that you are doing for your living as well and to have that sort of background of understanding of what's actually going on that so many of us wouldn't really have that kind of depth of understanding. Perhaps, and you're probably too kind, actually. To be honest, every day I realise just how much I don't know um, and how much how out of touch I am. So it, I, I get educated and schooled every single day by singers and performers and musicians, so no. Um, at least I have some inkling, but no, I'm, I'm still very much a student. <laughs> I think we all are to some degree. Um, so yeah. I guess so many people would have um, an, a general kind of idea of what an, an ENT would do in terms of surgery, like a basic kind of understanding. But would you be able to maybe take us through a little bit about what your kind of average working day might look like? Hmm. And maybe, I suppose, just for the audience today, I'll talk to you a bit more like um, the voice, airway, swallowing aspects, or laryngology, as you mentioned. So I suppose as an ENT surgeon, first of all, we generally work in a team. So we usually work closely with um, voice therapists, which is obviously a subspecialty of speech pathologists. Um, and so we're very much a sort of um, complementary duo a lot of the time. And 
patients, I suppose, come to us mostly in terms of when they feel their voices and somehow somehow disordered. And by that, I mean their speaking voice or their singing voice um, and or both, and maybe their airway and their sense of breath uh, and their swallowing. So an average day might involve um, all day of consulting. We will see um, patients and clients. They can be professional musicians and performers. Um, or just um, an older person who's missing out on talking to her um, friends over Zoom during lockdown because her voice is giving out. So everything in between. So we'll have consultation with them. Uh, we take a history. We examine them using specific equipment, um, which enables us to see down into their, their larynx, their, their source, their sound source, their voice box, their vocal cords, um, either through the mouth or through the nose, high definition cameras, something called stroboscopy, which is essentially almost like a slow motion video camera um, image, of those vocal cords vibrating at a few hundred times a second. Um, and we give them uh, some diagnoses and plans and then treatment options. And these treatment options might be anything from simple reassurance. No, you do not have nodes or nodules. You do not have a hemorrhage. You're okay. We give you permission to keep singing, to keep belting, to keep rehearsing, um, through to voice therapy with one of our uh, voice therapists, through to medical diagnoses, and of course, surgery. And that surgery can be done awake or asleep. Some minor procedures, such as putting fillers into vocal cords, we might do um, awake for a patient. Uh, and then obviously other operations are more major and they be under a, a general anesthetic. So, yeah, it's a huge range, but that's the sort of the gist of it. Well, it sounds very varied. And I guess, what I mean, it sounds like you see so many different people for so many different types of things, but what are some of the most common things that people might come to see you about, maybe even particularly people that are concerned about their voice? For sure. So I think, interestingly, during um, reflecting on co uh, lockdown, the last 12 months has been very um, interesting how it's changed the people that come to us. So I think there's a few groups of people, um, people who are performers of in, their, in their own right and who have, uh, have been not performing as much, not rehearsing as much. Uh, and so there's a degree of underuse or loss of vocal fitness. And with that, um, they might come saying, look, I've lost my range, I've lost my stamina, or I get discomfort and pain when I sing through here. Something's got to be wrong. Um, help me out of this sort of death spiral I'm in. So there's a lot more patients coming with that kind of sort of lack of fitness or fatigue and strain kind of aspect. Um, there's also been a lot of more patients with a cough or a throat clearing. As you can imagine, that's a real problem during COVID. Um, so whereas in the past we'd have very few or less of those patients, there's a lot more people with that concern. And then, of course, there's the more general things. Pe pe people worried that their hoarse voice signifies something serious, something nefarious, you know, maybe throat cancer. Um, and, um, uh, and a few other, um, I suppose, Things that are almost like, you know, we often say that the voice box is a barometer of um, human emotion. It's really, a, it betrays you a lot of the time. And that's whether you're just an average person talking like we are, or if you're a coloratura soprano. And so I've, we've seen a lot more people with, you know, a feeling of a lump in the throat, um, quite literally, you know, a feeling of lump in the throat where it's merely the strain and stress of life and lost opportunities and whatever else, or even reflex for that matter, manifesting here. So um, there's a lot more of that and, and perhaps a little bit less of polyps, um, nodules um, or nodes, um, bleeds on the vocal cord that you might see when people are using their voice heavily and to live audiences or to um, a classroom full of preppies. Um, and so there's less of those what we call phonotraumatic or overuse presentations and more of the slightly nuanced underuse vocal fitness type aspects. Yeah, I guess a question that's come up through this for me and maybe some of our viewers as well, when when should a person be considering coming to see you, someone like you um, or, or sort of looking and going, or oh, maybe I'm a little bit fatigued or maybe I should just go to my GP? At what sort of point do you think that someone should be taking it seriously and taking it to the next level or do you think that they always should be? Now, good question. 
Yeah, no, I, it's a, that's a cliche I bring out a bit. Um, but as far as how the voice box works, it's a question of form over function. It's not a beauty contest, it's a function contest. Firstly, I suppose, just to get out of the way, if you've got a, a voice change, pain in the throat, that doesn't go after way, uh, away after, say, two weeks, at most maybe four, you should at least be checking in with your GP and saying, no, is this tonsillitis? You know, help me out. Just in that very rare occasion that it's something serious. But remember that that's still the exception, not the rule. Putting that aside, essentially, any time that your voice doesn't do what you need it to do, if that's looking after mm -hmm. the kids and reading to them at night, that's a problem for you. Um, if it's yeah. not being able to sing your full set, if it's that your range is gone, or your passaggio has a bigger break than it used to, yeah. and it's a problem for your quality of life, then you should you should look into it. Now, you might do that yourself. You might do that through mindfulness or seeing a vocal coach or doing a little bit more time on warm-up and warm-down or drinking less caffeine, sleeping more. Um, or you might see a GP, and you might see us. So um, all of the above is the right answer, you know. Um, it really... Um, depends, but it comes down to if it affects you and your well-being as far as your voice is concerned. Go get a chance. Then <laughs> attend to it. Get back to happy. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. And I'm also very curious, you know, in a lot of our musical styles and things that are around at the moment, there's a lot of people that are trying different sounds and different ways of using their voices and I'm wondering if you've come across a lot of this kind a lot of effects out of some of these sounds in your work and if that's yeah. had any effect on the vo on the vocal cords of some of the patients you've seen yeah that's a great question um I'm I'm 41 so I consider myself, you know, fit, right smack bang, middle-aged man. Um, but I'm not as cool as I think I am anymore. And so I'm always learning about new vocal techniques, you know, and so, and all through our patients. So the other day I learned about cur uh, curbing, uh, screaming fry and other aspects of, of um, metal performance. I learned a bit about, or I learn a bit more every time I see a perform in that genre. Um, and you know what amazes me? Well, and not amaze me, but, you know, what I find fascinating is how one can do what might sound so far traumatic really well and without trauma because we can um, achieve these sounds with really good technique. So a lot of the patients I've seen recently, and I say patients lightly, they're just coming for a healthy vocal cord check a lot of the time, uh, you know, um, trap metal, heavy metal, rock, belters, etc., cetera, um, have a, um, a really good background in terms of their training and their vocal technique. And, you know, they can easily um, belt out a, a standard or, a, or even an op opera solo um, as they could, um, some, yeah. some curbing or some, some heavy metal fry, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I suppose um, it's not as um, – initially when I got into this, I thought, oh, that just sounds so devastatingly bad for your chords. But um, – uh, and this has been just as an ENT, and I'm just, you know, I have only um, a certain degree of knowledge that's complemented by everyone else on the team. Um, it's not as traumatic as I expected. Yeah. No, oh, that's very interesting. And does this sort of answer that question, Karen? Yeah, it does, absolutely. And um, and so you mentioned as well the team. Would you be able to maybe give us a little bit of an understanding of who's sort of on the team and who you work with to really give that full um, team? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a cliche, right? There's always a team, but it's true. Um, so as I said, the first part of the team really from where we stand is that the core is like m m the speech path and I, or the voice therapist and I, and in, I'm lucky enough at voice where we work that um, uh, a lot of the, those guys are already singers and performers in their own right and have that musical background, but that's the, the core. Then I suppose the next bigger circle is the, per the, the people in that patient's team. So if they're a professional musician, they'll have a vocal coach. They'll have, they may have a manager and that's a whole different kettle of fish as well. Um, they're a key part of the team, but at some parts we, they step out of the room, if you know what I mean. Um, 
And then beyond that, from a medical sphere, there is, say, a neurologist, so nerve doctors. So sometimes people might have a stammer or a tremor or something that we, we send to a neurologist for. Um, it might be that it's because their sense of breath, they're short of breath and they don't have enough breath because they actually have uncontrolled asthma or um, a chronic lower a respiratory tract problem. So we'll send them to our lung guys. Sometimes it's in uncontrollable reflux that we can't get on top of or a feeling of discomfort here. So we'll send them to our, our GI or gastroenterology guys, so the specialists that look after uh, the food tube and the stomach. Um, and of course, there's also a performance psychologist and another key part are um, performance physios. So we work closely with a few um, big groups who do a lot of um, circum head and neck work, I suppose, but also more Alexander technique, breathing, posture, uh, uh, core strength, etc. as well. So they're a key part of the team um, as well. So it's really refreshing because there's always a, a problem for some patients that we can then share and we can we can navigate a solution which is which is great no that sounds absolutely amazing um i guess as well looking at i mean obviously people are coming to see you when they notice that something is wrong but what are maybe some things that people can do to prevent some of these issues so um i know you've spoken a little bit about vocal technique but are there perhaps some other things that we can do to take care of our voice to avoid some of these issues cropping up? For sure. So taking a step back, and I know it sounds really obvious and it's a bit of a platitude, but um, general good physical health exercise in terms of core strength and physical fitness and vocal efficiency, if you've got good breath support and you, you are healthy, um, that goes a long way in terms of if we're talking about singing and general and in general, um, the duality then is also of the body as the mind, um, especially during this last twelve months. Um, we've found that a lot more is, it's more than ever tied to one's mood um, and mental well-being, uh, and it's tied into getting enough sleep. So as much as it seems so obvious, it's amazing how quickly we forget that. Hang on, that has a big impact on on this. So those are the more general things that we all, we find we're revisiting more and more. Um, more specifically, um, things like laryngopharyngeal reflux, it's a little bit overstated perhaps in Google and the media and the world. Um, everyone knows about Gaviscon and low acid diets and things, but certainly reflecting on your, your, your diet and lifestyle in terms of um, say irritants that might increase reflux, um, that is, you know, for those of you who don't know, it's uh, basically that sort of retrograde or movement of stomach contents, enzymes, and acids up the food tube and up to the voice box, causing things like hoarseness, a feeling of uh, a lump in the throat, mucus and clearing. Um, and so we talk about reducing foods that increase reflux. And unfortunately, it's all the good things. <laughs> it's caffeine, it's alcohol, it's peppermint tea, it's fatty foods, fried foods, spicy foods. Basically, anything that Uber Eats delivers <laughs> is probably reflux inducing. Um, and then um, uh, in terms of other aspects of health, uh, vocal health, of course, it's the things that um, a lot of singers know far better than me, which is make sure you make time for your adequate warm up. Don't forget you warm down. If you're a professional doing a lot of Zoom work, make sure your environment that you're doing your Zoom calls and meetings on is appropriate in terms of sound attenuation, good you know, feedback, good mic, um, good posture. Don't slouch and Zoom in on, in your bed, you know, with your head on your uh, your chin on your chest. Um, all these little one. Percenters can make such a big difference um and i suppose reflecting on your own vocal health on a fairly regular basis in some way even if it's like you have your standard glide or your standard little passage that you like to use as a test um something like that or even making a lot of uh the, the sort of more um uh high ends the wrong word but the very serious professional singers we we meet um can become you know almost obsessive about it you know they'll have a, a diary where they'll talk about in there they reflect on their voice day to day and what they did or didn't do um so they can keep track and sort of work out beyond superstition what might be the thing that they need to do to stay healthy you know 
Um, mm. and, I'm, and maybe maybe it's new to people, but certainly if you ask around, we find everyone has their own little story on that front, you know. Yeah, no, that's that's so fascinating. And I think um, I guess if we look on the other end of the spectrum as well, are there some things that maybe people are doing that maybe they might not be aware could be damaging their vocals a little bit or causing issues that hmm. maybe they, they think is absolutely fine? Yeah, well, that's a great one. So speaking voice, right? We take our speaking voice for granted as just something we're able to do forever and ever, you know, 25 hours a day. And the singing voice is the thing we treat with kid gloves and, um, you know, pay a particular attention to. So you go to sing, you'll have a good posture, I'm assuming, you know, you'll warm up and you warm down, but then you'll go and just sit on the couch and talk for three hours or use your voice casually. So we find a lot of singers and casual voice users will have poor technique with their speaking voice more so than their singing voice. So that might be something that a lot of people don't realize. You know, we see a lot of young up and coming performers uh, maybe, you know, um, who are doing a lot of press or just doing a lot of um, interviews and things you know, around their singing, and that really takes its toll. So having a sense of your speaking voice and how you're doing that, you know, not falling into fry, um, having good breath support, forward resonance, doing all those things that you might do in singing, mm. having it in your voice as well when you speak, I think is also quite useful to think about yeah and I think that's a really important point to bring up because I think a lot of people don't even think about the way that they're using their voice when they're talking so yeah that's great um I also wanted to bring up you've been working on a, an app um for vocal fitness training uh would you like to maybe tell us a little bit about what's inspired you to work on this app and what it's all about for sure I think it's a few fold. Um, in our line of work, you know, we treat a lot of disorder um, and that tends to be the focus, but there's a lot of great people using their voice for all kinds of reasons that just want to stay fit and stay healthy. And, you know, every second person has an Apple watch and they can track their, their sleep now and they can track their physical fitness and their steps and so on. And I just thought there's no real way I know, easy way that's user friendly that I as a lay person say could track my vocal fitness. And so I started having conversations with singers and um, other voice doctors and speeches, voice therapists about what that might look like and how we might be able to approach something that is user friendly. And so we've been, honestly, I think I've been working on it for about four or five years, but like every love project, it, it gets that spare time somewhere between 12 and 1 a.m. and you know, it's taken a while, but we're kind of getting there. So I think um, that was more, I suppose we're trying to focus on what a performer or singer might want to do to, to, to track their vocal fitness, but also get those insights we talked about. You know, if there's a way you could track some key parameters in what might represent a healthy voice, objective one, yeah. but also track super important emotional um, functional factors as well. And even stuff that you might not think about, like your, your menstrual cycle, for example, in terms of vo vocal fluctuations, um, those insights might be empowering for you as a singer. You might go, uh -huh. you might have one of those little epiphany moments. Um, and so we wanted to tr see if we can work on it. So look, it's still in alpha stages and, um, you know, as much as this is a plug for it, um, you know, yeah. You know, anybody who downloads it, we'd just be fascinated to hear what they think really and whether they, how we could make it better. But um, that, I suppose that was the inspiration. And um, yeah. No, oh, that's great. And so if people want to actually download and, and be a part of the testing, where can they find the app? Yeah, for sure. So it's uh, just, um, you know, just make sure that it actually works. But Google InfiniVox app. <laughs> um, and it's just InfiniVox. That's I, like infinite, I-N-F-I-N-I-V-O-X, as in voice box or vox, uh, dot com. Uh, and that should lead it just to a very simple landing page where you can download it. There's no clickbait. There's no endless spam emails. 
Um, we ask your permission to maybe say hello after a week of you having a play. Um, you know, um, more our co-conspirators are uh, another uh, doctor who's also an IT guy uh, and another doctor who's also uh, an opera, a soprano opera singer. Mm -hmm. So we all have um, a passion and a love. And ideally one day, perhaps if this was able to track, you know, personally for people, their voices, one day maybe it could become a, a bit of a, um, a place where people can share their, their vocal exercises and their tips and their tricks um, and become a bit more of a, a community. But for now, it's sort of trying to make it a bit of a tracker. So thanks for mentioning it. Um, no, and if anyone wants to check it out, we'd love to hear your thoughts. I do have to ask you as well. I am very curious how you manage your time <laughs> because you, I know as well that you do have three very young children. Um, you're an ENT, you're consulting, you're building this app. And on top of that, I, I believe you're in, quite involved in the medical side of the marketing as well. So you do have so much on your plate and you've joined yeah. us tonight. <laughs> so how um, how do you manage to fit all of these things into your schedule? I do all the things I tell my singers not to do. I don't sleep much. <laughs> I drink too much caffeine. I don't smoke at least. <laughs> but um, yeah, but look like like this um, what you're doing, Karen. It's if it's if you have a passion, somehow it just energizes you. And it, I know that sounds a bit sort of fluffy, but um, oh, it just keeps you going. You know. Uh, when other parts of life are difficult, you know, your day job, you know, when you're wearing 14 layers of plastic and seeing people and swabbing them and so on in the last 12 months, you go home and you see your kids or you do this little passion project and you quickly find some energy. So no, no different to anyone else who has a passion out there that they're chasing, you know? So, yeah, no, very good. Um, and, um, is there anything I must else apologize. I realized. I started this interview with a lovely sunset and now it looks like I'm under the duna covers. So <laughs> All right, we're seeing a full range of weather changes. <laughs> so um, is there anything else that maybe you would like to share with the community, um, whether it's to do with their vocal health or anything else that you'd like to share with them before we finish up? Um. The, the one thing I would say is find your um, confidence in terms of your voice. Uh, and I think you find your confidence through knowing your voice better. And I don't mean become obsessed and worried about it, but certainly if you have a concern, you know, see your, your, your vocal coach, um, find a path back to confidence uh, and healthy voicing. Um, because we get so tied up in knots as, uh, uh, and I say we, but um, your, a lot of your audience and I've looked at your website and I see the wonderful contributors and performers and amazing new talents. Um, we get so tied up in knots uh, in our own internal dialogue. So make sure you share your voice, whatever form you find, be it sounds on the couch or elsewhere, share your, um, your concerns, your fears, just and, and keep using your voice. Even you know, if you're not performing, you have not gigging, you're not laying down an album. Make sure you're still using that singing every day, or or reciting, or slam poetry, or whatever you're doing. Um, just like any other part, you exercise, you stay healthy, and um, remain confident. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And I guess if people are looking to find you for a consultation or have decided there's something that they need to um, discuss, where can they look for you or look for somebody like you that might be able to help? By all means. So in terms of national bodies that really are uh, great for locating someone in their area, I would say the two key ones are the Australian Voice Association. Uh, and that's a, a beautiful multidisciplinary organization that is um, full of um, singers, um, performers, vocal coaches, uh, ear, nose and throat specialists with voice um, expertise, and of course, um, speech pathologists. So that's AVA, Australian Voice Association. Uh, and number two would be the uh, LSA, which is the Laryngology Society of Australia. A little bit more medically based. If you want to find yourself a voice doc uh, in your town or nearby, that's where you'd go. As for me, I'm with a team we best in Melbourne with the Melbourne Voice Analysis Centre, um, and you can check us out there. 
Um, if we're online, you can live chat us at all kinds of weird hours. So I'm working on Infinivox or something, and you can shoot us a question um, and, uh, you know, um, check us out and come visit us in Melbourne, get a GP referral if you're really worried. We'd be more than happy to, to try and work out your concerns uh, down in Melbourne. Oh, that's so amazing. This has been so insightful and I thank you so much for taking the time to have a chat with me. Um, Not at all. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. And thank you everyone for watching.